discussion about civil society in peace building and civil society inclusion in peace processes is very relevant because civil society is an actor that cannot be neglected. Civil society is always there and civil society plays a role. The question is um, why and how this role contributes to change in, in different contexts. And I think that's the interesting part. So it's not about, is there a role for civil society, but it is about what exactly can civil society do. And this is what we have focused a lot in the work in, in different countries, in research, and in different consultations with civil society um, around the world. So I think the, the other thing is about civil society is that you have to see the context why we are having this discussion, even if civil society has always been there. I think in the early 90s, the focus was really reshifted from a focus on only states in peace processes to also looking at other actors such as civil society. But why is it still relevant? I think there was a big hype, oh now it's the local actors that are really important, because there was a lot of challenges and problems with the international system of conflict management and peacemaking. So looking at the local actors was also seen as we have to now have everybody on board and local actors play a role. So I think the role of local actors was also internationally more and more getting attention. And I think because of that attention, more and more civil society actors, both internationally but donors, were looking at how civil society functions and were asking questions, what exactly can civil society do? So I think that was also a starting point for many of the investigations in research we had and the conversations with civil society society, how can that work be relevant and effective to really produce a sustainable peace, to produce inclusive societies at the end of the day. So overall, when we look into what we found in the research that we have done over many years on civil society in different contexts and all the practical work with civil society in different contexts, it was very astonishing that you see all those different contexts, but there are some similarities, there are patterns that always work very well and other things always don't work very well. So it was our intention to find out what are those patterns in order to find more clarity about what civil society can really contribute to peace, to peace processes, to peace building. But before we talk about what are the results, what civil society can do, I think it's worth having a closer look who is civil society. Because if you look at civil societies, one has to say almost, around the world, there's a very diverse picture. You have groups like neighborhood groups, you have um, journalist associations, you have um, unions, you have non-governmental organizations, human rights uh, groups, peace building groups, research institutions, religious actors, traditional actors. So who is civil society exactly? So on the one hand, I think um, it is clear that civil society is some sort of a sector of society. But the other question is, is it a space between sectors? Um, I like to see it more like a space and I'll tell you why. Civil society has different roles and you can have different roles in different sectors in society. Imagine you are a member of a political party, then you would be part of the political sphere. Imagine at the same time you have a small business, so you're also part of the business community, but you have at home a family and you're also part of the family of the personal sphere. But you are also active, for example, in your neighborhood, very engaged in the school association of your children. You are engaged in your neighborhood watch to provide security to your, to your immediate community. Imagine this is all one person. That means civil society crosses through all those sectors. The question is just who are you when you have a particular function? For example, in the peace process and the negotiations in the Democratic Republic of Congo in DRC, there were a lot of civil society actors invited to take part in the negotiations and the dialogue to end the war next to armed groups and next to political parties. But it was never really clear were these actors there as civil society or they were just sitting there with a the civil society ticket but really pushing their political interests. So it is very important for civil society to be very clear, yes, I can have many different roles in my life. 
that's normal. But in which role am I sitting here? Am I sitting here as a civil society person or am I sitting here representing my family or representing my political party? This is the important thing. When we look at the results of the research we have done on civil society and peace building, I would first like to highlight the three main overall findings we had. First of all, maybe not astonishing to many people, we found that civil society matters, that civil society is important, but it is also supporting other actors. So it is not that you can achieve peace by only looking at civil society. It's not like that. It's more complex. You would have a complex set of actors that pushing in this direction and civil society is one of them and it's important. The other finding is that it's not just like supporting, for example, civil society or having civil society or acting in civil society that this is enough. You need to know exactly when is it relevant to do what exactly. Is it a time where it's relevant to do more advocacy for peace? Is it a time where it's relevant to more look into protection of community because there's a lot of violence? Is it a time where there is a peace deal or another uh, agreement that needs to be implemented where different actors look at different aspects of it? So one need to know exactly what is the relevant thing to do at, at the time. The other aspect, of course, is the how. It is not just enough to say, yes, we do protection. No. How do you do protection in a way that it can produce effective outcomes? How can it have impact? How can it really protect people? And there are many lessons on how all these different functions of civil society can be more effective. But even if you have very relevant work that is also has all the preconditions for effectiveness, it might still be very difficult to achieve peace and political reforms or change in a country because there are environments and contexts civil society operates in that are at times very challenging. And what we found is that there are a number of factors that really matter. So it's not just like context is important, we all know that. It is what type of elements in the context are important, like how does the state react to civil society? What level of violence is there? Um, how is civil society itself? Is it polarized? Is it cooperative? Is it uh, permitted with a lot of power structures as everything and everybody in society? So it is important to make a closer look at what are those contextual factors that really influence and enable or constrain civil society. And we will walk you through more details of all these findings. Let's have a look at the functional approach. The functional approach, first like people are saying like, what is that civil society functions? Because very often is civil society seen as a set of actors. And a lot of research and also practical work has focused on identifying actors. So if you go to a country, you would like to know who does what, what are the actors in civil society. So what is now the advantage of having a functional approach as compared to an actor approach only? Functions mean what does civil society do? And what we found is what is protection, is monitoring, is advocacy, is service delivery, is facilitation, is building bridges between divided communities, is socializing people for peace, for example. I'm coming to that. But the crucial point is, is really why is this functional approach so interesting and why so many people around the world find it very useful. So the functional approach has the advantage that you look into what is done in support of peaceful change and peace and not who does it. And I give you an example why this is so important. In Nepal during the war, we have seen, for example, that uh, very little civil society activity at times because there was so much violence and the space for civil society to act was very shrinking. But there were these forest user groups comprised out of community members who were very active and because the um, armed groups were hiding in the forest, the forest uh, user groups were the ones confronted with the armed groups and they were organized around the country and there's a lot of forests in Nepal, as you know. 
And they were probably at a certain stage an extremely important civil society actor for peace building. But who would have mapped in a civil society peace building mapping forest user groups? So this is an example where you can really see you would like to find out who contributes to peace and not who says that he or she contributes to peace. So that's the beauty of the functional approach. It really gives you the bigger picture of what is going on for peace support for moving societies on a pathway to peace and not just who has a mandate to do that because at the end it doesn't matter like who does it it's about that the peace work is done so when we look now into the functions um, i mentioned that we have identified seven functions and they, in fact, came from a combination of looking into long-term research on, on transitions from war to peace, from authoritarian rule to democratic rule or other changes, in combination with what was actually uh, going on in terms of the activities that were actually performed by various civil society groups around the world. So we have first protection. Protection is a very important function because very often there's violence. And when there is violence, the protection of people is an essential function for civil society. You could now say, um, why is not the state protecting people? And that would be a very right assumption, because it's a fundamental function of the state. So it doesn't mean that a function is solely there for civil society. It depends on the context. See a situation like in Cyprus, where you have since many, many years, a UN protection mission, we found hardly any protection activities done by civil society because it was the UN taking over that function. So in other contexts where there is no state operating, there's no UN there or any other protection entity, very often civil society is taking up that role, consciously or unconsciously, but civil society is protecting people all the time. We have, you, have, you see this spontaneously happening, but you see also collectively organized forms of protection, like peace zones, where you have um, in, in Yemen, where people were going around the communities collecting weapons to reduce the level of violence. Or we saw in um, Colombia, peace zones where neighborhoods of indigenous communities organized themselves and were trying to protect their communities, negotiating with the armed groups and bringing security uh, to their communities. So there are many protection initiatives in the world. The question is often, is this a localized thing, protection? And does it reduce violence? Or is it sometimes also connected to the broader picture? We also found few cases, like in El Salvador, I give you another example of um, protection. Many communities in Syria, for example, when the war started and still um, are doing protection of people in negotiating with armed groups, in bringing people together and discussing their community security. All these efforts are very often under the surface of what the international community sees. It happens all the time and women, for example, have been often at the forefront of protecting their communities and doing this community work for protection in many areas. This has also um, implications, like in the Syria case, um, when is time to do protection work? When is time to do something else? So very often when there is a very high level of violence, it's quite clear that protection is essential. I've seen project, for example, to, um, in, in Sri Lanka, there was a project um, training journalists in journalistic skills, how to overcome um, rivalry, conflicting reporting at a time where journalists were arrested or shot dead. So the shrinking space for this journalist training was so crucial that it was important to, at a certain stage, set up a fund for protecting these journalists, just for mere survival. And this fund was then set up and journalists who were in danger could go to a neighboring country and, and, and were supported in finding a work there. This is a good example where you can see it is not enough just to do something because 
uh, countering hate journalism is certainly a right thing to do, but maybe not at a time where journalists are not there to do this work because they are protected, not protected. Under what conditions is protection effective? It's the combination between protection, advocacy and monitoring that makes those function more effective. Because if you protect people and you make at the same time a lobbying campaign that these groups should be more protected, then they are also protected because of the mere fact that there is more communication and advocacy and media news about them. And it's not so easy then uh, to, to do harm to them. So bringing them to the attention of the government, of the international community, is a matter of protection that often is also used by, protect, by professional protection NGOs that would accompany, for example, activists, um, because they know if they are there, that means there is a knowledge about these actors. So being connected and known is a form of protection. Let's move to monitoring. Monitoring is also an important function that happens all the time. It happens during violence, it happens in the aftermath of violence, because there's always something to monitor. That means monitoring changes the issues that are monitored. During high levels of violence, what we see is mainly uh, human rights uh, violations, monitoring of human rights violations, uh, monitoring of peace agreement implementation is something that we can see after peace agreements have signed. Monitoring of, uh, for example, minority uh, provisions or rights like women uh, and gender clauses in agreements or how are gender values respected and monitoring. So monitoring is happening all the time. Under which condition is monitoring effective? It's a different thing. When is it relevant? So relevant monitoring is always relevant. The question is what issues are relevant? We found that monitoring can be more effective if it's combined, for example, with advocacy. That means if you monitor and have a lot of data on what has happened, but this, there's no mechanism on how the results of this monitoring efforts are brought to the public, are brought to those who can affect change. So this is very crucial that organizations who do monitoring have a communication strategy, have an advocacy strategy, attached to their work in order to make monitoring very effective. We have seen cases where monitoring has immediately reduced levels of violence, like in the case of Nepal, where there were many local organizations doing monitoring. Interestingly, all these local organizations were not coordinating and cooperating because they were in different territories, they were from different, maybe even conflicting political outlets, but all of them were reporting to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. So all this information was coming together and this information was used by the internationals to make lobby for a human rights monitoring mission that actually came to Nepal and had a very positive effect of bringing an end to the war and putting pressure on the conflicting parties. I think this shows you also that uh, there can be diverse efforts. Even if they are not coordinated, they need to be coherently working towards the same goals. But that would not help if they would not share this information and send it somewhere so something can be done with that information. Let's move to advocacy. What we find with advocacy is that there are basically three types of advocacy. There is this kind of more secret back-channel advocacy. We have seen that uh, sometimes, for example, business, prominent business people or religious actors, very high-level representatives of churches or mosques, go to the conflicting parties um, or political parties and lobby for them going to the negotiation table, them ending violence, them doing this or that. So we see this and it happens all the time. And it happens and it is effective because these actors are respected, important members of society. They are eminent people and that's why they are able to, to do this and they are listened to. So this is also nothing. Um, I've, I'm often asked like by outsiders, like, how can we support this work? And many of those um, sometimes called like insider 
mediators, insider advocacy people, they have been sent to training courses. And often you see, um, so training might not be um, bad, but for them, the precondition for their work is really because they are known, they are respected and they have the connections. So this is nothing you can really learn. Um, and that's different from public advocacy. Public advocacy can be a very professional task. And we see many professional advocacy organizations or advocacy wings of peace building or other organizations or human rights organizations that do very professional advocacy campaigns. And that is certainly something where one can provide support to and uh, have skill training and really understand how that is done. And advocacy is particularly effective. The third form of advocacy is actually mass action. And mass action can be street protests, uh, demonstrations, but mass action is by far the most effective at form of advocacy and maybe even form of civil society engagement over time you can see. Because civil society in a change process is often the trigger element uh, when it comes to change. Like think about the Arab Spring, think about the early 90s in Eastern Europe, think about um, uh, in Liberia where the women were on the street for weeks, for months, to demonstrate for ending the violence. And at, that means it's very, very powerful. And of course, today with social media and the connection to media, it is more effective than it was maybe at the times without the support for media. But it's also telling that advocacy as such is of course most effective when it is combined with communication, with um, strategies to really bring to the attention uh, to a broader public that something is going on. Because if, you, if there is a moment of change in a country and there's masses on the street and everybody knows and sees that these masses are on the street, that's one of the most powerful things civil society has done in, in many, many contexts. The question is often, how can you keep the momentum? Because what we have seen is, Mass mobilization comes together when there is like a uniting factor. Mostly it's when there is, it's about the big thing at the time. That means ending the violence now, ending authoritarian rule now, um, going to the negotiation table now. So these are the things that bring a broad spectrum of actors together that might have very different opinions. I have been asked by many civil society organizations often, how can we form this mass movement and mobilize if we have all different political opinions? We just can't agree. And I often tell them what we found is in our research and in, in, in other people's experiences that it is not necessary to agree on a political agenda when you want to do mass action. It is important to agree on an overall goal on an overall objective. What is the minimum uniting factor of a broad mass of organizations and, and people in the country that they want to bring forward and that would be so strong that they could all jointly protest for it. That's what you need to be, have an effective mass organization. Of course, you also need organizational skills and communication and all this, uh, that's clear. But that also shows that the difference between public, professional public advocacy campaigns very often target a particular issue that might not be of interest to the en entire society. Like you would see like um, now with the youth agenda, for example, lobbying for more youth inclusion into decision making, or maybe um, having a parliamentary uh, quota for more women and young people included in a particular time where this uh, topic is in, on the political agenda. Then you find those groups who have a strong interest in these matters coming together, but you would not, you would not find that the whole society would stand up for, for this particular issue. That's different with mass action, as I have mentioned before. Another function is socialization. What is socialization for peace? What we found is there's two types of socialization. One is providing values, democratic or peace values for society. It's often done through peace education, civic education, 
changing school curricula and uh, activities like that. The other one is what we call in-group socialization. This means that a certain group, imagine for example an underprivileged group, indigenous actors in Guatemala during the war, um, how can they get more in-group identity in order then to be able to do other things? So I think we have to differentiate those two. Let me elaborate a bit on those two. So um, socialization of values and happens very often uh, with non-governmental organizations, do programs in schools, very often extracurriculum activities, peace theater, peace education. And what we found is actually that these activities they are on the one hand very important, but we found that they have often been not very effective. How can one make uh, socialization activities for permitting values of peace and uh, conflict resolution into society. We have to look who has the power in a society to provide values. So very often it is the families, it is religious actors and institutions, it is schools. So that means work has to be done with those actors because if you, if you don't include those who have the power to socialize people, it's, it's very often very ineffective. Uh, all these extra activities that only those who are already convinced go to. If you have a child that goes to school and it can choose between football, theater or peace education, where would it go to? You will find all the children of those who are very pro-peace saying like, please go there daughter, go there son, I would like you to go there. But most others would just go for football and for theater. So that's not very effective. It's much more effective to change the curriculum of the school, look into getting these values right into the curriculum, but also working with teachers. But also what we have seen, like I've, I've visited schools in northern Uganda, for example, where they really did a very good job on bringing this into the school curriculum. But then the kids went home and told that their parents and the parents were like, what are you telling us? So the problem was the families were not brought into that program, which after an evaluation, they actually changed and brought then the families within into this program. So the children would also come home and have a suitable environment. And at the same time, the socialization would include teachers, children and families. So this is the way you can make socialization activities much more effective as compared to only doing some education activities along the side. That is often very difficult. Think about um, conflicting religious or uh, political agendas about socialization and often actors have shied away to taking on the difficult actors that might be hard to socialize. We have seen that in Northern Ireland uh, not only during the war, even after the war, that the, the Catholic and the Protestant actors still would like to control the values of their communities and make it very difficult to work with them and, and bring them together. But the bringing together is actually another function, and that is um, the social cohesion function, which we could also say it's bridging, building bridges between divided communities. The question is who are divided communities and that is very important because what we have seen around the world that the focus and this is a key focus actually of the peace building community uh, bringing doing conflict resolution workshops a lot of training is provided uh, workshops to discuss and bring those constituencies together but what we have seen is that the work has not always been effective when it has been effective, it really looked into all sorts of divides in society. So it's not enough to think um, who is like, you would have the traditional conflicts where you have like two antagonistic groups, or let's say at least on the surface, you would have the Hutus and the Tutsis in, in Rwanda or in Burundi, you would think, oh, this is the obvious group. But is that true? Are there not other groups in society? And are there not also other dividing factors between those groups? Yeah? You might have 
different factors like class, education. So often the focus is, is done on, on the, bringing the groups together. I have so and so many from this side, so and so many from this side, and not paying enough attention to the diversity of that group. So you can bring together a very similar strata of society in, for example, only bringing together the Hutus and the Tutsis or the Catholics and the Protestant or the Muslims and the Christians that are already very convinced about bridge building and peacemaking. So we see when we looked into evaluations, for example, of, that were taking place before those workshops that brought people together and after that the the questionnaires were filled in the same. Yes, I think that it is very good to talk to the other side. And at the end of the workshop, people said, yes, I think it's good to talk to the other side. So often what we call is what's happening is preaching to the converted. And uh, why is that? Because it's, it's also easier. Let's face it, it's very hard to get conflicting actors in polarized societies together. So it's also not easy to just blame people that they do that, but to understand why this is happening. And to see now uh, how this could be sort of done differently. How can those divided actors be brought together with different means? And uh, organization of professional workshops, what we have seen is certainly one thing. What we have seen is very effectively is actually work-related initiatives where people come together, not because they are told to, this is a space for reconciliation, which very often people find very hard to do in divided societies, especially when there is, has been a lot of violence. In um, Rwanda, even religious actors would say, there's no point. The only thing we can discuss is living together in peace, but reconciliation, we don't want to discuss it. Or in Bosnia, you have reconciliation after the war, people, they just didn't want to hear it. But if you talked about in Bosnia, for example, um, bringing refugee to communities together with communities that stayed on, and let's try how do we do this integration best, bring the community together and say, so we have a problem to solve together. And this often has a much more positive effect uh, on bridging uh, these divides than the more apparent obvious work for reconciliation. So one has to really uh, see what is in a context the most appropriate form. In Israel-Palestine we have seen quite successful bringing together of um, Israelis and Palestinians around water management in the Jordan or about the discussions in the city council uh, Jerusalem at the time, while it was very hard to bring them together for just saying, come and reconcile. So I think this is really very important and it's also important to really be very conscious about uh, differentiations in society. Are there all male people from upper class or are we talking about young people and women and men mixed from different geographical regions and strata of society? Facilitation. What is also the difference between um, bridge building and facilitation? Because many people think it's kind of the same. What we differentiate here is like facilitation is really the act of facilitating between various actors that could be, for example, facilitating humanitarian access. This thereby, it's very connected to the protection function to go there and help actors to access uh, these areas. There can be facilitation, of course, um, between, and we have seen that uh, high-level facilitation, we have seen that often that uh, church leaders in Mozambique uh, brought uh, together the conflict parties. Uh, that is facilitation. But the churches also did local-level facilitation in the diocese. So um, between actors that were not cooperating, it's not, it's not directly the same as bridging divides between polarized communities. It's more um, either really for peace, where you bring key actors together, and here, as I mentioned, we have seen very prominent civil society actors doing that, or it is really the act of facilitating something. It can be also facilitating a new law, 
for changing uh, gender regulations in a, in a constitution. It can be facilitating between different groups you bring together, for example, different sectors of civil society, like the bar association comes together with the business association in order to jointly discuss a parliamentary uh, bill that, that is passed. So facilitation can have very different forms. And what we found is that we couldn't say this or that pattern was effective or not because it was very context specific. So that was, I think, the only function where we couldn't really identify global patterns because it was so context specific. Um, let's talk about service delivery. We had long discussions. Is service delivery providing um, services to the community, is that a peace building function or is it a development function? What we found over time in, in looking at different types of service delivery is it is a peace building function when it is combined with another function. So it's not just providing services in itself is not a peace building function. You need to also be conscious about its peace building function. That means if you bring together, if you, if you have a project for providing boreholes, I've seen that a lot in semi-arid areas where like war-torn countries like let's say Afghanistan, Somalia, a lot of projects to bring water points. How can a water project be an entry point for peace building? It can be first of all when those who do it are aware that they could create actually entry points for peace. That means bringing those divided communities together as I mentioned for the bridging, but using service delivery as an entry point for this. And, um, and this is a really big opportunity for civil society to do something for change because it comes along in the beginning more technical where often there is an openness to do uh, service delivery. Everybody wants services. So it's really often much easier to have services as an entry point. However, services can also be done in a very technical manner without looking into who gets these services, what are the dividing lines, what are the power relations you're creating uh, when providing services, who takes part, who is excluded from the services, but also from the decision making that will lead to decisions over who gets services, where a road is built, where a bridge is built, where a hospital is built. So these are all factors that will determine how inclusive this development is and how much it doesn't only in the short term contribute to peace building, but also permits socialization, permits values into a society because people take part in their own decision making. There was, for example, some research that found that people value being part in decision making for service delivery as they do the service themselves. Let's talk about enabling and constraining factors, because it is equally important not to only look into what functions are needed, when and how can they be made more effective by the different actors that perform them. It is equally important to talk about contextual factors, both external and internal to civil society. It is equally important to really have a good assessment of that. What we found in our research is that there are some context factors that matter more than others. The first one is uh, the behavior of the state. Shrinking space for civil society is one of the most threatening and um, disencouraging factors for civil society to be enabled to play a role, to even perform the functions. Uh, and there's two aspects here. One is how the government reacts. Um, we all know the examples of the Arab Spring that in Tunisia for example, the government and the military decided to support the protest and don't intervene violently. And in the aftermath, a national dialogue process was initiated. Um, and some people, as we know, even got the Nobel Peace Prize for their engagement in this dialogue. While in Syria or in Bahrain, uh, the regime, the government reacted very violently and stopped the protest. And 
in, in uh, Syria, as we know, the sad story is known that what happened so many, many years of war and lost lives. And can we imagine the Syria story differently? If the government would have reacted differently, if the military would have reacted differently, if there would have been a national dialogue process in Syria, building a new Syria, it would have been a very different story. So this is a very shrinking element. So if we think about civil society, and it means also that advocacy needs to be done towards governments to change their behavior, and not only for civil society to do action. So this goes really hand in hand. Violence. Violence is the other key factor that makes or breaks the possibilities of civil society. In context of extreme violence, the space of civil society shrinks enormously. And that's why it is so important to invest in protection and to invest into human rights monitoring of and, and doing everything to end violence. Because ending of violence and reduction in violence is the precondition for civil society to work. Um, another factor is media. Media are, can be pro-change, can be anti-change, can be putting certain issues that civil society, for example, on the advocacy agenda has there. They can put it on the agenda or they can put it away from the agenda. So having a communication strategy, working with the media is important. But it's also not just important, it's again, how? Because very often there has been a lot of effort in doing uh, peace journalism training. And while the journalists who took part in the training were not the ones deciding on the content of the newspaper or the radio station or the TV station, they were employed. It were the editors or the publisher houses. So it's important to understand the media system in a country and who makes decisions and then building a strategy around what can be done with the media, but also helping civil society and for civil society to understand their connection and their influence on the media. Another aspect is funding. And this is a very, can be very enabling, can be very destructive and disenabling. And this is very important because often people think, would there just only be more funding, then all this great work could be done. But it's not that simple. Some civil society uh, functions and activities need very little funding, but they might need a lot of capacity or equipment or if you do um, uh, do secret back channel um, advocacy, you don't need a lot of funding probably. Sometimes you might be need an air ticket because these people are not in the country and that can be very easy and very cost effective to just bringing you there. But very often it is the connections that make it. If you do a mass mobilization, it's often also not really a question of the funding. It's a question of coordinated effort and a lot of voluntary effort. If you do a, a professional advocacy campaign, you certainly need funding. But funding we have seen many, very many sad stories about how funding has disabled civil societies from functioning. Funding is power and it can create changes in the power relations within civil society. Who gets the funding? Why these actors? Why not others? Um, is funding enabling, for example, collective action? Is funding enabling uh, uh, some communities over others? So funding is a very, very sensitive issue. Though important, but very sensitive. We have also seen very good civil society local organizations that have done great work. And then they have been overwhelmed uh, with funding that they basically became managing entities that were not able to do their work anymore because they were only writing project proposals to different donors and were just doing reporting, project proposals, reporting, log frame writing and they became um, sort of the sad story of professionalization of civil society and professionalization is needed but professionalization also can be needs to be sensitive so that it doesn't do harm to voluntary action and it doesn't put overburden civil society. Donors very often discuss um, that they know this 
uh, that they know that civil society is often overburdened. Civil society um, is often not allowed to do joint reporting, but has to report separately. We are knowing all this, but we see very little change, very little change. And I think that is also often very disempowering for civil society. International actors and regional powers can be very important, especially when they influence governments to change or they empower or disempower actors. So international lobbying is often part of civil society work in a country in order to uh, change conditions in a country or change conditions like international lobby networks on, on, for example, climate change, what we see now a lot, to create global preconditions for change. But let's talk at the end a little bit about what are enabling or disenabling factors within civil society. From the outside, often I hear like, oh, civil society is a good society that needs to be supported. Yes, it can be, but civil society is most of all society. It's a mirror of society. So if civil society is a mirror of society, it's very normal that it has all facets of society. Peace supporting, not peace supporting, even like we have seen the Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka on the streets uh, demonstrating against peace. And that's certainly not because Buddhists are not peaceful, but they were against this very peace process. Um, in other um, contexts, you have a lot of polarization, and that's very normal. So often people ask me, like, um, oh, we feel so bad because we have all these different political opinions and we are so polarized, and... but it's normal. If you have a war, if you have an armed conflict, if you have a political reform process, it's normal that people have different opinions. Civil society would not be civil society if it would always speak with one voice. It's a, mayor, it's a characteristic of civil society to be uh, diverse. So the question is, how can one uh, make advantages of diversity and bring those diverse voices together for change? Sometimes that's not possible. Other times coalition building is possible and can be very effective. But the point is that also in civil society we have power relations. Most civil society organizations in the world are run by men that are older than 40. We have, of course, women organizations that run women organizations. We have young people running youth organizations, but we have not so many young people in decision-making bodies of professional NGOs. We have not so many women. So we have imbalances. We have also in societies where you have one caste or one ethnic group, one religious group being the majority. Of course, this is also represented equally in civil society. So who sits in civil society boards, who is actor in civil society is often a reflection of that. So how can civil society start becoming inclusive in itself is an important factor of bringing societies on a pathway to inclusive peace. And that is equally important than doing action. It's no point of being a civil society organization that is, has an exclusive membership and then doing inclusion and conflict resolution workshops. So practice what you preach is a very, very important thing for civil society as well as uh, their supporters. Another trend that we see in terms of civil society internal problems is what we call the NGOization of civil society. Um, civil society has started uh, in many countries as a voluntary undertaking. So people doing voluntary work and that's why they are in civil society. And we have talked about the need for professional civil society organizations to run campaigns, to do perfection, to do monitoring in a professional way or to do conflict resolution workshops and peace education in a professional way. But we should not forget that civil society is also a voluntary space. So what happens very often in societies um, after war, during war, where change happens, uh, that these voluntary forces come together for change. And after that, they don't really know what is their exact role now. Some just go back into other roles, they become politicians, as we have seen in Eastern Europe after the, the political change in the 90s. Others go uh, just out of civil society or they go to certain civil society spaces. But the point is like, 
how can civil society protect it from just writing log frames and becoming so professional that they're not even able to do voluntary work and to act and become competitors among each other. So it's a sensitive issue. I'm not saying that professionalization is bad. It's not bad. But one has to be careful and sensitive about not creating an industry of civil society that is um, not able to, to perform anymore if funding flows are ebbing and going, which also doesn't mean that funding is not necessary, but the way it is provided is important. My last point is civil society is not only happening in a country, there's also diaspora. And if we think civil society in a country, diaspora is a very important uh, part of civil society because it often provides political support, it provides funding for local civil societies. And it can be, because it's far away from the context, sometimes uh, it needs understanding of the context in order to act. But it's a very powerful civil society member and needs to um, be taken care of.